I'm going to start by telling you a little story. Um, so a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, um, this was my Christmas present from my husband. Um, so he, uh, he, put, he took our, our three children, he sat them down in our living room, he took a Kinect camera and went around and scanned them and then, you know, 3D printed all these models and, you know, it was probably the best Christmas present I ever had. Um, except, you know, of course, these models don't show how they move. They don't show all their funny little expressions or um, any of the way that they talk. Um, if we wanted to actually create, for instance, uh, uh, an experience, uh, an, an AR experience or a VR experience and go back and have a chat with our children when they were very little, we would need really photorealistic um, avatars that captured all this motion, right? And that captured very, very, very highly detailed uh, 3D, 3D uh, properties of the models. So if we actually want to do this these days, we, you know, this is the current technology. So you need to put markers on actors. You need to wear one of these cameras that, you know, it's got a lot of different cameras looking at your face. This is very, very intrusive for actors. Um, you also, for instance, need to probably sit in a light, um, in a light stage like this and have your face captured by hundreds of cameras with different lights shining at you. So this is hardly commodity hardware, right? So it's not really a commodity process right now. Um, whereas the Kinect camera going around a person, yes, that's commodity. Anyone can do it in their living room. So really, you know, my ambition has always been to take out all of these very difficult technical, um, well, uh, problems that, that we have to, uh, to, 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 to do to create these very, very realistic models. So if we want to create a digital double and capture really high quality geometry and reflectance, you know, this is the kind of quality that you get with a, with a light stage. Can we actually do it just from a single image? Can we just do it from a video that's been captured with a single camera? That's what my research has always been about. So there are many companies that are now working on photorealistic avatars, um, such as Facebook or, for instance, Magic Leap. They have this, uh, this virtual assistant, and they're still following this, this trail of, you know, let's create 3D models by capturing tons and tons and tons of data. So instead, you know, this is my ambition. Can we actually have just a single image, or can we just have a video that's been captured by a single camera, and can we create very realistic models and very highly detailed models like this. So, you know, I started working in this direction many, many years ago. So um, this problem in computer vision is understood as, it's called non-rigid structure from motion. And we started in early 2000, and these are some results of what we could do in 2006. So it's pretty basic, right? <laughs> We've moved on quite a lot, but at that time, these were the first systems that were looking at a face, tracking some points. In this case, just a bunch of points, very, very few points, very sparse reconstruction. And using uh, some, um, some optimization approaches uh, to reconstruct the face and to maybe even analyze the facial expressions of this person, right? So moving on, um, we have been the pioneers who, you know, we created the, the, the first monocular uh, online non-rigid reconstruction system. This is work that we published in, in ICCV a few years ago, where the input here is just a single video. It can be of any object. You can see it here on faces, but, you know, we can also use other deformable objects we have a single video as input, and we're producing detailed geometry. Um, so you can see here that we can reconstruct a hand, we can reconstruct um, toys, we can reconstruct lots of different uh, non-rigid objects. And this is the kind of level of detail that we can get in our models. So this, for this, we, we're using uh, model-based tracking techniques. So this is an optimization approach where we have a current live frame, we have a model, 
and we're trying to minimize some photometric uh, error. So what we want is for matching pixels to have the same color, basically. And we use this, this loss function to find out the, the pose, the new pose of the, of the object. So this is an unsupervised learning approach, right? So we don't require ground truth three-dimensional uh, measurements here. So we're not using a, a neural network that's been trained on, on 3D data. We're actually matching 2D data. And this is the power of combining 3D, 3D models um, with unsupervised learning. And of course, you know, these are the kind of results that you can get. So now this is my daughter again. You can actually see here that, you know, this is a video that we took in the garden. And we can now recover the geometry. We can recover, recover all her, you know, nice little expressions. And we can also recover the appearance. So we can also recover, you know, all the, the, the texture of the, of the face and, and the lips and the mouth. Okay, so... No, this is where this is where the dream started, and uh, once we, we we worked out how to do this, how to turn a monocular video into a 3D model that's deforming over time. So this is where you know we kind of thought, well, this is really the right time to start up a company where we take advantage of the fact that we can now reconstruct 3D models just from pure video, just a single video. These reconstructions are highly detailed. We have information about the appearance. So the idea of our company of Synthesia is to take um, two videos. So we have a video, a source video um, of, uh, for instance, in this case, if we want to use it for video dubbing, we can take a video of a person who's speaking in a different language and we can map the lip motion from one speaker to the other speaker. So in this case, we can create new videos where the speaker can be talking in now in new languages. Um, so the voice is still the voice of the, of the original actor, but now the lips are in sync with what the person is saying in the other language. So probably much better than me explaining this is to show you um, a video of the, uh, of the technology in action. So this is our team. We're a, a really brilliant technical team um, and, uh, you know, very talented people, but also very kind of positive and um, a, lot of, a lot of fun. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Video en Mirongtan, Muritwe. O amaza la tortu lo tiflan kulle de rigatain. Mais nous pouvons y mettre fin. Nous savons comment, nous en avons la possibilité. Ame ora di karvai ki zaruraten. O men shia rang shise linda ran kwanju. Hivyo tunazindua kampeni ya sauti. O mwele bawari upi malaria. Speak up and say Malaria must die. One voice can be powerful, but all of our voices together, then they will have to listen. Malaria must die, so millions can live. Okay, so what's important about this is that um, David Beckham doesn't speak any of those languages, of course. Um, um, he speaks English, he probably speaks a little bit of Spanish as well, he spent some time there. Uh, but these are the voice actors. These are the people who speak all these languages. They're from different countries in Africa. Um, and um, this was actually when we filmed them in the studio. Um, so you can see that we've just got a single camera pointing at all of these actors. And they just very comfortably uh, said their messages. And then what we can do is, is take all these videos, reconstruct the 3D models, and transfer the motion from one model into another one and resynthesize a new video. Of course, it's not just about the 3D tracking. Um, there's a lot of deep learning in here as well. So there's some um, generative adversarial networks that are also doing the, the trick of synthesizing um, the, the, the new um, inside of the mouth, for example, which is something that we can't see. Um, but really, the enabling technology here was to be able to go from video to 3D in a, in a very easy way and to make this a complete commodity now. Um, 
Okay, so, you know, we've done faces. Um, so what next? Um, so some other work that I'm doing with my team is, uh, this is work that I'm doing in research at the university. Uh, we're looking at images of people. For instance, in this case, it's a project where we uh, have um, a robot that's looking at people carrying out maintenance tasks inside a warehouse. So this is, you know, in the wild, difficult images uh, to process. And we're finding out the 3D pose of the people directly just from video. So 3D reconstruction of human pose, monocular, um, and the other thing that we're working on as well is, you know, objects and, and full scenes. So here we're taking an RGBD camera. This has a depth channel. We're moving the camera around and we are reconstructing the whole scene. We're associating semantic labels with the objects and we're segmenting them from the background. So now we can see a reconstruction at the level of objects. So you can think about this as semantic slam. So we are adding some semantic information about the objects to the 3D reconstruction. So of course now, you know, we, we could potentially in the future, you know, to the key to commoditization of video synthesis is to put all of these th three things together, right? So we can do faces, we also track the, the pose of the body, and we can do full scenes, we can understand objects, which objects are present in the scene. Um, so I really believe that this, the route to commoditization of video synthesis is to have proper understanding and proper 3D understanding of the environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well done.